Hello everyone, welcome to Study IQ. So we will continue our discussion on history. So far we have completed two sessions in this particular module. That is, uh, we are going to discuss about 100 questions or 100 concepts, 100 important concepts in modern India. So we have talked about all the major acts, okay, till 1935 Government of India Act. Now we'll move on to some other important concepts. So today uh, I'll be talking about this permanent settlement, Mahalwari settlement, Rotwari settlement. If possible, I'll be talking about police reforms, judicial reforms, civil service reforms. And then we'll talk about subsidiary alliance. Then we'll talk about doctrine of lapse. So this is how we are going to pick the topics and we'll try to cover it in around five, six modules. Okay. Or five, six sessions. So that's what I'm going to do. So let's get started. We'll be starting off with uh, permanent settlement. Okay. So permanent settlement now who introduced this permanent settlement it was introduced by lord cornwallis okay lord cornwallis introduced this in 1793 now along with lord cornwallis the deputy was john shore okay john shore and this name is again very important because he is going going to be the next governor general after lord cornwallis okay so from 1793 to 98 john shore is going to be the governor general now when it was introduced it was uh, lord cornwallis who was the governor general his time period was from 1786 to 1793 and that you can see in his last year that is in 1793 he come up although he is going to come back to india for few months later as governor general but this is the most important year because it's the last year so there are certain other reforms also that we need to discuss just like i have mentioned police reforms civil service reform judicial reform and everything actually actually happened in this particular year okay and along with permanent settlement so let's discuss about permanent settlement so it was introduced by lord cornwallis where it was introduced obviously in his area he was a governor general of bengal so so it was introduced in eastern part of india so eastern part of india i'm talking about bengal bihar orissa okay so in these region it was introduced and some parts of tamil nadu parts of banaras also it was introduced it comprised of 19 percentage of british india a british india means if this is total india whatever area is under their control is what british india some princely states will always be there like this which are independent out of their control so british india 19 percentage this system permanent settlement was introduced okay now what is the system the system is like this who will pay the tax the person will pay the tax and who will collect the tax the zamindar will collect the tax and zamindar will give it to the state so this is a system person will pay to the zamindar and the zamindar will pay to the state so this is how the tax is collected now if the person is not able to pay the tax okay the person will be evicted and a new person may come into existence so that land will be given to some other person that means what i want to tell you is the ownership is not with the peasants the ownership is with the zamindars and the zamindar is having all the power to evict any person if he is not able to pay the tax on time but when i talk about this ownership this ownership is also not absolute if it is between so when we talk about ownership general the taxation is actually very high even though it was fixed on the of 1790 that which is fixed itself was actually very high uh, it was around 50 to 60 percentage of the total produce now that it is out of total produce involves the investment so it goes the fertilizer cost and there are a lot of investments and inputs was involved so effectively it comes around 80 to 90 percentage of the total produce okay so the peasant is hardly getting around 10 to 20 percentage out of the produce and it is very low for him so the taxation is actually very high that is the first problem secondly i have told you at any cost they have to pay the tax okay there is no even in case of crop failure also they have to pay the tax so in case of crop failure how they get the money they don't have any other choice but to pay tax if you don't pay tax you will be evicted by the zamindar remember the ownership was with the zamindar so they will have to approach the money lenders and they will take money at a very high rate of interest and that led to emergence of money lenders in rural areas okay so i can write here emergence of money lenders 
okay now with time what will happen the interest rates keeps on increasing they have to pay more interest next year whatever produce they have they have only money to pay for the money lenders still they cannot pay to the zamindar so next year if they cannot pay to the zamindar again they won't be paying the tax they will be losing their land so they lose their land and they have no other option but to become rural landless laborers they have to work on some other other people's land okay so emergence of rural landless laborers once they lose their land okay and that lead to a lot of other things okay a lot of see this is the this much amount of land is there earlier four people were working now plus 2 two or more two more people were working the land is giving the same output there is no change when there were four people and when there are six people okay so effectively these two are considered as unemployed okay you can't consider them as actually employed and this situation is what we call as disguised unemployment okay uh, which is a very common thing in indian agriculture setup especially because most of the unemployed people are absorbed in the agricultural sector okay which is unwanted and which is unnecessary which is reducing the productivity also so it lead to disguised unemployment poverty all these issues are associated to it okay so this is what the common problems which you can write as the consequences apart from this some specific problems which will come in permanent settlement that will be discussing now you see here when you talk about zamindar versus peasant okay zamindar is the owner if the peasant is not paying the tax what will happen peasant will be evicted new peasant will come and that's how this rural landless laborers emerged right now if you take the other way around zamindar versus state who is the owner it is state who is the owner now if the zamindar is not paying the tax a new zamindar will come okay so this the new person who is coming may not be from a rural area he may be an urban merchant he may be a trader or a businessman he is coming to collect tax or he is becoming a zamindar only with the objective of you know that 9 percentage commission so he may not be necessarily present in that area so he won't be there he will be engaged in his own business so zamindar too won't be there in that rural area in the land and he may appoint some other person to collect the tax so this situation is what we call as absentee landlordism absentee landlordism which is a specific feature of permanent settlement okay so absentee landlordism now you see here this zamindar is appointing another zamindar to collect collect the tax okay so this guy will get 9% as per what they have promised so what he will do is he will tell that i'll take 5% i'll give you 4% you collect the tax now this person can also do the same thing he will appoint another person by saying that i'll give you 2% he may appoint another person to collect the tax by paying by saying that i'll give you 1% he can also do the same by saying that i'll give you 0.5% so he is getting very low for 0.5% so what he will do he will try to maximize the revenue so that the 0.5 percentage will be higher so maximize the revenue means the only way is actually exploiting the peasant so you will be exploiting the peasant to maximize the revenue that lead to ever increase increasing exploitation of the peasant and i can write here chain of intermediaries actually the system demands only one intermediary that is a zamindar but because of the specific nature of the system the emergence of more and more intermediaries you can see here okay chain of intermediaries and that lead to ever increasing exploitation of peasants okay exploitation of peasants so i hope this is clear for all of you now see if let's suppose that state is demanding the peasant to pay 100 rupee this year next year and every year you are supposed to pay 100 rupee now if if the production has increased still you need to pay 100 rupees so the peasant is supposed to get the benefit but zamindar will not allow him to pay just 100 rupees zamindar may charge 200 rupee okay but how much zamindar is supposed to pay to the tax as per law it is 91 percent so and state is asking you to collect 100 percent state is not asking you to collect 200 uh, 100 rupee not 200 rupee so state is asking you 100 so you can uh, recordically legally you can collect only 100 so how much you can give it to the state 91 and you are supposed to take 9 
but zamindar collecting how much 200 how much you need to give it to the state you can give 91 only and you only give give 91 because state is asking you to collect 100 you can't tell the state that i have collected 200 and I, therefore i am paying 182 no that is not possible you will pay 91 to the state and how much the zamindar will get 109 So I hope you understood how the zamindars are getting the benefit and neither the state nor the peasant is getting any benefit out of the system. Okay. So I, I hope things are clear here. Let's move on to riot virus system. <coughs> riot virus system. Okay. <coughs> Riot is actually a Persian word whose meaning is a uh, uh, peasant. Okay, now this system was actually introduced by Munro, Thomas Munro, and read th this was a question in 2017. Okay, Thomas Munro and read <coughs> introduced by Thomas Munro and read. It was introduced in different phases, it was introduced in Madras. Okay, and it was introduced in uh, central provinces okay it was introduced in bombay okay so you can see uh, central provinces with capital nagpur so you can see it was implemented in maximum parts of the area so it was introduced in 51 percentage of british india that's a huge area so 19 percentage permanent settlement 51 percentage riot virus settlement now one thing students always confused us when we talk about riot valley settlement you may think that permanent settlement was abolished and riot valley settlement was introduced that's not the case permanent settlement was there and still there and it is continuing in the eastern part of india in those areas and this is in the southern and central part of india so south west and central part of india so it has to be very clear for you okay it was introduced in this areas 51 percentage what is the system there is a small change in the system here the peasant will have to pay to the british official who was appointed for the purpose of collecting the tax not the zamindar and then he will pay to the state so the system is like this the peasant will pay to the official who was uh, especially specially appointed for the purpose of tax collection and he will pay it to the state okay now zamindar as the intermediary so if you remember the two impacts so two consequences that we have discussed in permanent settlement absentee landlordism and chain of intermediaries are not going to happen here why because there it was the zamindar who was the landlord here the ownership was given to peasant that is also one of the most important point ownership was given to the peasant so peasant will always be present in their land so there won't be any chance of absentee landlordism secondly he is appointed for collecting tax so he cannot appoint some other person to collect tax he is a government official so there won't be any possibility of chain of intermediaries also so that two are very very specific to permanent settlement if the question is asked on permanent settlement you cannot afford to miss those two points apart from that too everything else is common in all the three settlements so this has to be made very clear now peasant will pay to the official and he will pay to the state now what else uh, we have discussed about system and uh, the system we have discussed who introduced where it is introduced what percentage area everything is done ownership also we have discussed peasant is the owner let's move on to the consequences exactly the same consequences high rate of taxation will be there money lenders will be there now here one of the advantage for money lender is here the peasant is the owner so the peasant can pledge the land now earlier that was not the case the peasant can pledge the land to the money lender and they can get money so ultimately there is a situation where the peasant always the peasant started losing their land and uh, the land will be captured by the money lenders or mahajans and you can see when we talk about deccan rights i'll be discussing about this one of the most important reason for deccan rights is see the marwadis who came from outside the outsiders started grabbing the areas of the insiders okay in deccan region there is a specific a special socio-economic political situations emerged where the outsiders completely grabbed the lands of insiders and we will be discussing about deccan rights so i'll be discussing this in detail so I just want to tell you that peasants are the owners and peasants can actually pledge their land. The other things are common. Again, landless labors will be there, disguised unemployment, poverty and all those things will be common. So I hope it is clear. 
we will move on to the next one that is Mahalwari settlement. Mahalwari. Mahal is actually a Punjabi word which means village. <coughs> now here who introduced this firstly it was introduced by Holt Mackenzie. Where it was introduced? It was introduced in north and uh, north western part of India. Okay, so you can see here it was introduced in that areas of Punjab. Okay, the so Punjab is a huge area that comprise of Pakistan's Lahore, Punjab, Himachal Pradesh, and all those areas will be there. Himachal Pradesh. Then it was also introduced in the uh, western part of uh, UP, United Provinces. So it was introduced in around balance areas that is around 30 percentage 19 the first one 51 the second one rest of the areas this one so 30 percentage of the area introduced by Holt Mackenzie now here the system is the person will pay tax to the Panjayat and Panjayat will pay to the state okay so the Panjayat is responsible for collecting the tax, uh, tax and uh, Panjayat will be the intermediary here. So the exploitation will be a kind less and the person who is responsible for collecting tax from the panchayat side is known as Lambardar or Nambardar in different areas. Okay, so this is a very simple thing. So if you understood the first one, other, others are easy. Just need to remember the names and the areas and what percentage it was. The system is easy. The consequence is almost the same. There won't be the two specific things which you have discussed in permanent settlement. There won't be any possibility of intermediaries. There won't be any possibility of absentee landlordism because the landlord is the peasant. So I hope it is clear for all of you. So that's about the three different settlements. Now let's talk about civil service reforms which was introduced by Cornwallis in 1793. We don't want to discuss too much about this. This was actually a question in 2014 who was who is known as father of Indian civil service. It is Lord Cornwallis who introduced this. Okay, So Lord Cornwallis. See if you remember I have already told you in 1793 this is this last year. So there was a lot of reforms which is considered very significant and important. And one more interesting fact which you can understand or which you may know related to Lord Cornwallis is he was a person who was fighting against the George Washington in America in their war of independence. And the person who was a biggest failure in America when he came to India, he have a huge success story to write. We have this civil service reform, permanent settlement, okay, and police reforms, judicial reforms, etc. Okay, which, which, which all comes in his name. So civil service reform, he introduced civil services, Lord Cornwallis in 1793. But remember, this was introduced and uh, not through any open competitive exam and no Indians are allowed to participate in this. No Indians are allowed to become civil servants. So we have just before we have done a discussion on Charter Act of 1833 under Charter Act of 1833, which is going to happen after 40 years, exactly after 40 years, there was a provision that no discrimination should be made in the recruitment of civil services on the basis of sex, color, creed, place of birth, etc. So through that, Indians were able to enter into civil services after 1833 Charter Act because of that provision. But the exam obviously will be very tough and it will be conducted in England and it will be in their favor. Their subjects and their philosophies okay so everything is related to them but still some Indians were able to crack the exam so the point is civil services were introduced not through any open competitive exam and not for Indians okay next uh, we'll quickly discuss about police reforms police reforms that was also in 1793 just before i've told you the power of policing was actually enjoyed by zamindars till then right so zamindars were desperate to become zamindars because they used to enjoy the power of policing and that's the reason why they caught unrealistic amounts during the type time of bidding process in queen quinial settlement okay that discussion is anyway over so here police reforms two points is what you need to remember police officials were appointed okay so police officials were appointed police officials were appointed second point police stations were established police stations were established okay so police officials were appointed police stations were established and the police stations were headed by daroga 
each police station is headed by Daroga SI, okay, sub inspector, and number of police stations will form a circle and which will be headed by superintendent of police, okay, superintendent of police SP, okay. So, this is how police reforms was introduced, and uh, you can see here if this is asked as a question, you will be getting two statements one, two. Okay, police officials were appointed, police stations were established. It is crystal clear one and two is the answer. But if I make a some small modification here, police stations were established on the basis of population. This is a question. This is the two statements. Now your answer answers are A one only, B two only, C one and two, D not one, not two. Then what is your answer? There is no doubt that first one is correct. And uh, some of the students will just read this police stations were established. They feel that two is also correct. So they can mark one and two. But some students will read it completely on the basis of population. So you might not have read about that. And I was not teaching you also about that. So in that case, you will start thinking because you can't leave it for chances you have to anyway if you're stuck between one is for sure so if you're stuck between two choices you have to attempt it the answer now here is either a or c right so if you're stuck between two you have to take this call in prelims that the hardly you will be able to uh, make sure that 30 per 30 to 40 answers are correct 100 percent rest of the questions you have to attempt you have to take chances there is no other way in which you have to make guesses you have to take chances okay always remember you can't go with this mindset that I'll answer 55 questions with 100% accuracy and I'll be clearing the prelims. That's not possible. You have to make sure that you will be attempting around 75 to 80 questions with 85 to 90 percentage accuracy. This should be the ideal situation. Not that 55 questions I'll attempt for all the 55 will be correct. That's not going to happen. That's never that is never ever going to happen. Don't think about that. Okay. So I want you to attempt around 75 to 80 with 85 to 90 percentage accuracy that will do good for you okay and after that obviously um, see prelims nobody can help you there is a lot of limitations mains you clear the prelims and you come to me i can help you in any way okay so now here uh, you can see here so i'll start thinking about it right on the basis of population see more the population more police is required more police stations required that's the logic so if you think in that way i'll go for one and two still i'll go for one and two but you know what is the actual what is the actual answer actual answer is this one only why because it is supposed to be on the base of population in in practice it is supposed to be on the base of population but police stations were established on the basis of area at that time but now it is on the basis of population now if you ask me it is on the basis of population more the population more the police more the police stations but then it was on the base of area for a particular area one police station for the other area one police station it hardly matters whether there is 10 persons in that area or thousand people in the other area i hope it is clear so that's about police reforms we will now discuss about judicial reforms judicial reforms now see this judicial reforms is also known as Cornwallis court so if you get this question on Cornwallis court then also you need to write the same thing uh, the Cornwallis court okay so there are some changes in the structure as well as the law uh, the structure was like this the lower level there was Munsif ki Adalat Munsifki Adalat and above that there was a court of registrar above that you have a district court and then there were two types okay there are two types of cases which we have discussed see many of the things i have already discussed i have done around hundreds of videos i have seen many students are asking about the playlist i don't know about that uh, hundreds of videos I have done. I have done hundreds of videos in quantitative aptitude. I have done again hundreds of around 50 videos in history. I have done in economy. I have done in almost all the topics. So it is impossible for me to create a playlist. Okay, I don't know where is it. But you have to see that videos. You can just search whatever topics you need. You'll be getting my videos for sure. Warren Hastings study IQ. If you search, you'll get that. Lord William Bentick study IQ. If you search, you'll get that. Every videos you'll get that which is done by me. 
okay so th there are two types of cases civil case that's why uh, because i have done all these videos that's why i'm referring it to the previous videos because most of the content i cannot discuss now when i'm focusing on this hundred important concepts okay so there will be civil cases which will be in diwani courts <coughs> so there will be diwani courts and there will be circuit courts so circuit courts are for criminal cases and this is for civil cases okay so these are moving courts circuit courts are moving courts these are fixed courts now lord cornwall has established four diwani courts at dhaka patna calcutta murshidabad now if you if you have seen if you have watched my first video on this series that we are we are discussing about the different acts in 1813 charter act 1833 charter act i have discussed a point that the four diwani courts which were established by lord cornwallis that is this which were this dhaka patna calcutta murshidabad were to be abolished and instead high court to be set up was one of the provision in 1833 charter act okay which was actually coming from here so diwani courts and circuit courts i hope you understood this the above diwani courts there is a sadar diwani sadar is actually a persian word which means head sadar diwani where the governor general will be sitting directly and here sadar nizamat where also governor general is sitting for the adalat okay so i hope this is a structure it, it is clear it is almost like the modern day structure only there will be magistrate courts then there will be district courts high court supreme courts and all those sessions courts and everything is there okay <coughs> what are the changes introduced in law so the changes introduced in law that is very important two new concepts were introduced by lord cornwallis and which we are following even now also and that is a basic pillar of our constitution the first one being equality before law very important one of the most important contribution of british okay equality before law see when we discussed about police reform that is also one of the most important contribution you can see you will get questions like this the law and order situation in india is drastically improved during british period yes law and order situation in india has improved drastically during british period the first point that we need to discuss is actually the police reforms then you can talk about anti tugi law which happened under lord william bentinck which i have discussed under lord william bentinck which i will be discussing as part of this discussion also later in one other session anti tugi law through that thugs were suppressed or they were armed people so that created a lot of issues in central part of india that we'll have to discuss but what i want to tell you is the law and order situation has improved drastically there was a policy from the british side if a criminal is allowed to hide in a village the entire village will be punished those kinds of systems what they have practiced so obviously the law and order situation in india has drastically improved during british time similarly they have introduced this equality before law till then this was not the practice see for example if you if you take the case of eye witness okay a judge is uh hearing the case and there are eye witnesses so if a rich and a poor person is coming so there is a rich and a poor he will listen to the word of rich because in his opinion he became rich because he is uh, he is good okay he, he is uh, always talking truth that's why he became rich but in reality the reverse will be true right maybe similarly an upper caste and uh, lower caste is coming he will be listening to the word of upper caste okay so there is no equality between two sections there may be a muslim and a hindu so he will listen to the word of a muslim and similarly male and a female he will listen to the word of male okay and there was an interesting theory related to this what they claim is the female is having less memory power compared to male and one male is actually considered as two female so one male witness is equal to two female witness that means if a male witness need to be overcome if you need to overcome a male witness you need how many female witness not two three two will be equal so to overcome you need three female witness and this all comes from mughal tradition maybe uh, that patriarchal system and everything okay we'll not get into that now 
so what I want to tell you is they have introduced equality before law. Now male or female, a young and an aged, even a kid can come and give an eyewitness statement in the court and which will be considered equal to a normal eyewitness statement. So that is considered as very important contribution of the British equality before law, one of the most important pillars of our constitution. Second point that I need to discuss is rule of law. So they have introduced a rule of law. That means everybody have to work within the law. Nobody is above the law. Even the governor general also have to work within the law. They have to follow the law. There is a procedure and you have to follow the rule completely. So these two are very important and two important contributions of British. You cannot miss this. So what all things we have discussed today, we talked about permanent settlement, Rottweil settlement, Mahalwari settlement, police reforms, civil service reform, judicial reform. There is a possibility of getting questions in prelims as well as in mains from these areas. So I hope this is clear for you. If you like the video, give me a thumbs up. And if you have any doubts, you can get in touch with me. Zia Safir, this is my Instagram ID. If anything is there, you can comment below. If there is any improvement required, if you want me to do any new topics, you can comment on that. I'll do that particular topics in coming times. Okay. So see you guys.